Uh, we looked at the dangers of allowing the devil to get into your marriage. We looked at the statistics of how uh, basically in America today, 50% of marriages end up in divorce. And usually it's because one thing is out of order and which causes another thing to be out of order. And uh, today most people don't want to fess up and admit responsibility and say, well, it could be my fault. It's all their fault. And that's brought us to the place that we're at. If we're going to be honest and humble Christians and we're going to grow together in the Lord as we serve the Lord together, we have to admit that usually we're both wrong or that we play a part in it. Even when you're uh, clearly in the right, you should still have a humble and a, and a, uh, a godly attitude toward friction in the marriage. Now we see a point where, where the devil was able to get to Adam through Eve. And uh, let's just take a look. We covered a lot of this ground, but I want to cover this again. If you look at verse number one, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any of the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And of course, that's what the devil wants to do, is cause you to doubt what God has already established. Verse 2, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit which is of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, she was obviously created after God made that commandment. Uh, Adam taught her this. She was obeying Adam as she rebuked the devil with this statement. She was following both Adam and God in trying to teach the devil what God actually said. But of course, the devil continues to attack. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Sin doesn't cause you to die. Maybe it takes time for it to catch up to you, and that's the problem with us today. We break free from the, the hedge of protection of God. We begin to sin. Nothing happens immediately, and, well, maybe God's hand is shortened. Maybe he won't strike me with lightning for doing such a thing. Ultimately, it does catch up. Sin entered the world, and death by sin. Death is passed upon all men, for all have sinned. And this is the curse that's on people. And Satan tempted the woman and caused her to sin, bringing this transgression into her marriage. Verse uh, number 5, For God doth know, this is the devil speaking, that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And that part is partially true. They were as judges, now judging what is good and bad, and yet their judgment was not just. Their understanding was not that of God. It was not righteous as it ought to be. Jesus said, we judge unrighteous judgment. We judge by appearance, right? Verse number 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, there's the lust of the flesh, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, the lust of the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, there's the pride of life. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And there I make the conclusion, what we covered this morning, that I do believe they had a chance to stop that. The woman should have stopped and involved her husband in the decision. Now Adam went along and sinned with her. I believe that in the, in the marriage, that praying together can save a marriage. It can build a relationship that will last for a lifetime. Continue. We've covered the ground we covered this morning. Now... The rest of the information is going to be a little bit more like a Bible study. We're going to look at the punishment from God, the implications toward us, and then there's also several things in here dealing with the end times. Look at verse number 7. And the eyes of them were both opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, after they willingly sinned, their eyes are open. Now they're as gods. That doesn't mean like a creator. That means like a judge. They get to judge over good and evil now. And there's a responsibility. They have to rule over their own life. And immediately their eyes are open. And look what it says. And they knew that they were naked. What's interesting is, if you look at the last verse in chapter 2, I believe it's verse 25, it says, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. What's the difference? What happened? Well, now they have sinned. They've broken God's law. They were not righteous. Something was wrong. The relationship was fractured. In Hebrews 13, it says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Listen, there's a time for that, and that's in a proper marriage. And then here, all of a sudden, they didn't realize their nakedness until they crossed this line when they disobeyed 
God. Their response was to cover it up with their own works. And we're going to get into this as we get to the end here, but uh, works and bringing things forth, this is part of the curse that's on man. We're dealing with the fall because of sin and death that comes in by it. And it's in our nature, it's in our programming to do works. God has cursed us with having to do certain works. And so what happens when you go to preach the gospel to somebody, they think that that also is by their works. Well, surely I must be a good person. Surely I must repent of all of my sins to be saved. No, it's faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's your personal responsibility. You have to believe that He saves you, and He saves you forever. It's your choice. It's your job to believe that. It's your responsibility. But what do they do? It says, look at verse 7. It says, They knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Aprons. Now, an apron covers the waist. The apron might cover this much information. It might not even cover all the way around. They're using a leaf to try to cover up their nakedness. They're using their own judgment, and their judgment was flawed. It's the judgment of a man, whereas God's judgment is just. What's interesting, as they bring forth their works, they try to cover their sin with their works. Isaiah 64, 6 says, But we are all as unclean thing, and our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us. Uh, look, your righteousness, all the good that you can do down here, no matter how great it is, it's filthy rags. We can't bring filthy rags to God for salvation. We need the spotless blood of the Lamb to save us. It's faith in that alone that saves. And, and what's interesting, he says, and it fades like a leaf. Here they covered themselves with a leaf, covering up their own works. How long do you think that leaf would last? I mean, if you were in a survival, all right, you've got to live in the woods for 10 days. You don't have any clothes. I think I'd find something a little bit better than a leaf. <laughs> I'm going to need something a little bit stronger and more secure. I mean, maybe a banana leaf. I don't know. Some of those banana, not, or the banana trees or the elephant ears. I mean, some of those are a little bit leathery, right? <laughs> but you think about it. Uh, what they were trying to do is cover it with their own works. It was the best that they could do. And the problem is an apron only covers the front bottom of your private area. It does not cover all of your nakedness. They were still in sin. It was not enough. Look at verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Well, now, this is interesting. The voice of the Lord God walking. Did you know God's voice can walk? Well, now, isn't that fascinating? Now, we saw earlier, as we did Genesis last month, in Genesis 1, verses 1, 2, and 3, we have the Trinity right there. If you would, go to John 1. Keep your place here. We'll come right back. I know you know it, but it's always good to refresh on it because there's some neat connections. We saw the Trinity in the first three verses of Genesis 1. And this is important because we don't believe in a temporary life, and we don't believe in a temporal Savior. We believe in everlasting life, and we believe in the eternal sonship of Christ. These two things go together. When it says they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden, in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. They knew something was wrong. They're dealing with God. They're hiding. They're trying to get away. What's interesting, and you know, I said, uh, this is the first place in the Bible the word cool is mentioned. All right, so God is cool. All right. <laughs> uh, there are several uh, uh, first mentions here. God's lowercase, husband, cool, afraid, cursed, conception, sorrow. We'll see all of those, and I didn't want to spend a lot of time on those, but uh, I do believe in the law of first mention, that through the context of a word and the first mention of words, you can find the definition. Uh, the Bible is a dictionary. It's trustworthy. It's true. This is all you need. You say, well, don't we need a, a Greek, Hebrew lexicon? Hey, it doesn't hurt, but you don't need it. If you don't need it. This is what you need to have faith in. Most of us haven't even wrapped our mind around the English language. Let enough. I mean, and here's my problem. Whose dictionary are you reading? Whose dictionary? Because there are dictionaries that will take certain words and twist them to make it result in a different definition. It's very important. 
even today you Google a word and look for the, diction, the definition. Uh, Merriam-Webster versus dictionary.com, it's going to be slightly different because they have to have their own trademarked version. So each dictionary is going to be slightly different. All right. Uh, you're in John 1. Of course, it's famous. We're not dealing with the temporary sun. We're dealing with the eternal sun. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Jesus made it all. He is our Creator. Look at verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jump ahead 20 verses to, first, to John 1, 34. John 1, verse 34. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. We're not dealing with a temporary sun, a temporal sun. We're dealing with everlasting life in a God that's always existed. He created time on day one, and he, he was outside of time. He created heaven. He's outside of heaven. Go back to Genesis chapter 3. So it's important when they hear the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Look at verse number 9, Genesis 3, verse 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Well, now, wait a minute. Isn't this the guy that just sewed fig leaves on himself? And yet, in the presence of God, he knows he's still naked. Look, I know it's not a popular teaching, but I believe that a man or a woman should cover themselves up, and I mean from the knee to the neck. I believe you should cover up your nakedness, you should not expose it. Or you mean men have to go swimming with a shirt on? Amen, that's what I believe. I believe that's righteous. There's scripture to back it up. It doesn't make much sense. The world can figure it out, but we can't. The Bible's true. And listen, here, he knows he's still naked. He only has an apron on. He's ashamed of himself before God. I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. Look at verse 11. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree? Where have I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Uh-oh. Who told you you're naked? What did he say in verse 7? And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Give us the knowledge. It's not just knowledge. Now you have responsibility. Yep. Isn't that how it goes? You get some knowledge. Well, guess what? Responsibility comes with it. Now you're responsible to answer to the knowledge that you've been given. You're responsible to do something with the information you have. And he says, now you've been opened up to not just good. They already had good. But now also evil. Now they had to make a judgment call themselves. The best they could do was insufficient. It was not enough. It didn't cover enough. They were ashamed. They were afraid of God because they knew they were naked. Jump down to verse 21. Look at later we'll see where it says, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. Coats of skins and clothed them. Now, Brother Clint was here earlier, and I told him I was going to pick on him whether he was here or not. Does anybody, can anybody remember a description of what he wore this morning? A leather coat. That was a long coat too, wasn't it? I said, man, that goes all the way down to your knee. You could hide a rifle in there or something, right? <laughs> now, he had a coat made of leather. That's skin. And it covered from here to there. I mean, that's a good example of what God put on them. He made sure it covered up all of their nakedness so that they were not to be ashamed, because nakedness is shame. Right. Even a child gets to that point when they start to, you know, as babies, they don't know. Babies run around the house naked. They can get away with it, right? Hey, I think it's good to even give some little babies naked time. They just, woo, I feel free, right? But then they have brothers and sisters and all that kind of, you know, things change. But when the child gets to that point where, hey, I want my privacy, you say, well, okay, they're recognizing their own nakedness. This is private to them, and it's not to be shared with anybody else. It's just for them, right? Now, in the perfect marriage relationship, God wants you to share that with your husband or wife, with your spouse, and it's perfect, and it's pure, and there's a purpose for it. It's to have a family. It's to reproduce. God made you like this in your programming. The world, they want to harden their face against God. They want to take their shame and flaunt it. 
They want to go against God and they want to use their body to defile themselves and, and, and just and really destroy all the good that's in their own life. Go back to verse 12. God had asked the question, Who told you that you was naked? Did you eat of the tree? Right? Verse 12. And the man said, The woman that thou gavest to be with me. Uh-oh. Now, here's the blame game. I love it. The woman. And then the man says, Well, it was, you know, I'm sorry. The man says it's the woman. The woman says it's the serpent. Right? This is the typical blame game. Now, growing up, I was told, if you're asked a question and the first word out of your mouth is somebody else's name, that's, not, that's an unacceptable answer. Right? Well, what happened in the floor? Well, <laughs> Brother Luke, he... <laughs> Is that necessary? Couldn't it even just be, well, there was a spill, and we didn't get to it yet. It's all his fault. It's not mine. I had nothing to do with it. Well, I did have something. But really, it's his fault. Right? <laughs> Isn't that how it works? Do you want to play the blame game? Because Adam's confronted by God with his sin. You broke the law. You messed up. There's a judgment coming. Why did you do it? It wasn't me. It was that woman you gave me. Well, now, wait a minute. She was there to help him. And we saw this this morning as we dug in deeper, but she did her part by uh, teaching what she was taught up until a point where she was weak. She's the weaker vessel. That doesn't mean uh, a weaker person. It means more delicate. And the devil attacked her to get to him. And the problem is he caved also. We, some of the men and I were talking, we were joking about this last week or the week before. It's like the couple that, is, he says, why don't you just follow me? And she says, why don't you lead? Well, there you go. Everything's out of order. Now, what happens is when either one is out of order, continuing disorder never fixes the problem, does it? I gave the illustration of pulling string or pulling rope. We want to push the rope. I need you to do this. I'm going to push you into doing it my way. That's not how you do it. You know what? I'm just going to do the best I can, and I'm going to follow the Lord, and, and you follow me. Follow me as I follow the Lord, right? And that's why we lead, as, lead by example as Christians. And here, Adam begins to blame the woman. The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Now here, Adam failed to lead by example. He submitted to her sin. He had a chance to fix the problem, to redeem her, to correct her, to intercede on her behalf. Who knows, right? And again, I'm not going to preach a sermon on what ifs. Somebody, somebody made the comment, well, what if Adam had cut the tree down? Then they wouldn't have to worry about the fruit. I'd probably electrocute him, you know? I mean, come on, it's the tree of life. I don't think you could cut it down and kill it, right? Uh, he failed to lead by example when he submitted to her sin. Now look at her problem, verse 13. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Beguiled means deceived or tricked. The, the, it's the devil. He tricked me. The devil made me do it. Now, here's the problem. Eve failed to obey her husband's instructions. We went back this morning at the timeline, and Eve was created after God gave the commandment, but she knew the commandment verbatim, which means the husband taught it to her. He, she had clear instructions about the tree, but she made her own decision for the family. And here's the problem. She disobeyed her husband, and she disobeyed God. And Adam followed the error. He continued the mistake. This is how we fix things in the marriage, is we have to humble ourselves and admit that there's probably fault on both sides of the street. It is a two-way street. Communication must flow in both directions, and admission of guilt must flow in both directions. If we're going to have a healthy Christian marriage, then we need to work together. We need to pray together, was my point this morning, to have victory over the devil in our life. Well, now God goes to the serpent. Look at verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly thou shalt go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Now this is the fleshly curse on that beast that was a dragon that this devil liked to inhabit. It was changed from this point. Look at verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, 
and thou shalt bruise his heel. Go to Matthew 23. Now he's talking about a spiritual curse. This is the beginning of spiritual warfare. The devil attacked. Go to Matthew 23, if you would. The devil attacked, and Eve fell. Sin entered in. And now God's saying, now there's going to be the serpent's seed and the woman's seed. Now, just to clear some things up, this is not a physical bloodline. The devil does not have a bloodline of children. I know people, have, <laughs> the Illuminati bloodlines, everybody born in this bloodline is really a dragon. And, you know, they're, they're half alien or half dragon. or There's some pretty strange stuff out there. That's not what this is teaching, okay? Uh, but the, the, the devil does have children that are alive on the earth that have not died and have not gone to hell yet. These are people that are alive. They're called uh, apostate or reprobate. They're rejects. They're dross. They're people that hate God and everything to do with him. And they're actively fighting against God and his children on the earth today. In Matthew 22, it, Jesus said, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. He's, so listen, the angels don't reproduce on the earth. That's bad doctrine. If somebody tells you that angels are, are having babies with, with people, that's bad doctrine. Angels cannot reproduce. They're spirits. They're a flame of fire. This is a curse in the spirit. This is part of God's spiritual curse on the devil and his fallen angels. You're in Matthew 23, find verse number 15. Matthew 23, find verse number 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you can pass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Now, how does somebody become a child of hell? What's the Bible saying here? They have to be uh, proselytized. What does that mean? It means to be converted. Somebody has to be convinced and converted to become a child of the devil. He's preaching to the Pharisees that in secret they were worshiping other gods. In public they were preaching a work salvation. And Jesus confronted them to overthrow their system. And he's saying, listen, you are convincing other people to choose something other than God. And that's going to come back on you. Go to John chapter 8. Listen, to become a Christian... You have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. John 1, 12, he says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. We must choose to be a Christian. It's saving faith. Galatians 3, he says, You are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. How do we become children of God? By choosing, by our faith. Yeah. Calvinism is a lie. The gospel of Calvinism is a false god. It's a strange doctrine. It's from the Protestants. And listen, Baptists were never Protestants. We were never part of the Catholic Church. We didn't go along with the Catholic Church. There is no Pope. We don't baptize babies. We believe in believer's baptism. Once you choose to believe, then you should get baptized as an example of what's happened internally. John chapter 8, Jesus again dealing with the false prophets. Look what he says in verse 44. We read this this morning, but look at it. John 8, 44. You are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. So wait, he's dealing with children of the devil. as Right here, these are children of the devil. Uh, who, greater damnation, he says in Matthew 23. Their fate is already sealed. Look at it. He said, he was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. They reject him. They couldn't believe. They didn't want to believe. It's their choice to become a child of the devil. Go back to Genesis chapter 3. So there is a seed of the woman, and that would be Jesus Christ. Jesus would become the Son of Man, or really the Son of Mankind, right? Uh, he would be in the flesh. The seed of the serpent is those that knowingly reject Jesus Christ as the Son of God. They don't trust Him as their Messiah, as their Savior. Galatians 4, it says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. God sent forth His Son, made of a woman. This is the seed of the woman. For what purpose? 1 John 3, it says, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that He might destroy the works of the devil. 
There is spiritual warfare all around you and we cannot see it. It is the devil's children attacking God's children and you only get one of these by faith. I've often said there's three types of people in the world. We're born neutral. There's children of the world or children of the of Adam and you choose to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you become saved. You're a saint. Or on the other side of the spectrum, you say, I don't want God. I reject God. I'll take anything but God. And you choose to become a child of the devil and you harden your heart. He sears your conscience. There comes a point where God gives you up unto a reprobate mind and that's your choice. It didn't happen because God made you that way. God died for your sins and you still rejected him. And so these two on the other side are fighting for those in the middle. There's three types of people in the world. We're over here. We're not wrestling with flesh and blood, trying to attack the people that are over there. We're trying to get the ones in the middle, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by flesh. You're back in Genesis 3. Again, look at verse number 15, because again, we're dealing with the gospel here. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That's the gospel. Jesus died on the cross. Satan thought he had a victory. Oh, but the Lord will come back. Look at verse 16. Unto the woman, he saith, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow. There's three points he gives her. One is, now you're going to have a sorrowful heart. He says, and thy conception in sorrow thou shalt bring forth thy children. Right? Now you're going to have sorrow in conception. For, I think uh, the state of a woman, although she was already a weaker vessel and a unique person, uh, made different. I think perhaps she's more emotional or something. I mean, if you read the Bible, it says, uh, you young men pay attention. When you get married, it says you spend a year trying to cheer up your wife. A whole year trying to cheer her up. She's like, oh, I'm in love. I want to marry you. Then she gets married and she's like, this isn't what I thought. <laughs> and you spend a year trying to cheer her up. They're made different. God made us different and unique for a purpose, right? <laughs> Sorrow is now part of this curse. Sorrow in conception is the other part. But then look at this in verse 16. It says, and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. It's interesting. When Satan said, you'll be as gods, that word gods is used as ruler or judge elsewhere. And he says, and now you'll have a ruler over you. She usurped the authority of the man by taking the fruit on her own without seeking the counsel of the man. And now this is part of it in that she has a ruler. That God puts the man as the head of the house. Which of course there's a bigger responsibility there. But she made a decision against God and against her husband, and her pride allowed her to usurp the authority. Look at verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. Uh-oh. Now look, Adam was supposed to hearken unto God. He was supposed to hearken unto God. Instead, he disobeyed the Lord's commandment. He's not leading right. He's not being upright. Listen, man's focus in this world, think about this, man. Your focus should be on how to lead your focus is not on how to get your wife to follow. Right. Well, if I could just get her to follow me, now why don't you lead by example? You start doing what's right. Yeah, but she's always doing what's wrong. Well, you do what's right, and you put it in the Lord's hands, and let Him deal with her heart, and she'll follow you. And that's a two-sided coin. Sometimes the lady was, I wish she would just lead. I wish she would take the spiritual responsibility. I wish she would read the Bible to us. I wish she would pray with us. I wish she would be the man that he ought to be. Well, instead of usurping the authority and being rebellious and being full of pride, just be the woman that you ought to be. In the fear of the Lord, submit yourself to your husband and serve him as you ought to and put it in God's hands and let God deal with his heart. Do your part and let God do his. Man's focus should not be on how he should lead, but rather or it should be on how he leads, not how to get her to follow. So he says in verse 17, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, that was his sin, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Now he's saying, cursed is the ground for thy sake. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult for you to grow food, to provide for your family, and you get some sorrow to go with it. I mean, <laughs> boy, that's work. Now you think about this. Originally, God planted a garden. And then he set the man in it to dress it and keep it. God did the planting. God made it grow. God did the watering. It was perfect. All man had to do was walk up and say, I'll take one of those. And ooh, this looks good today. 
wasn't good enough. They sinned. They fell. Now God says, okay, now you're going to have to till the ground. It's going to be by the sweat of your brow. You're going to have to work with sorrow to provide food for your family. Look at verse 18. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Listen, your body's going to turn into dust, but your soul will live forever. And here's the curse now, that now that things are fractured and broken, he says, while you're here, it's going to be very hard. It's going to be hard work for you to provide. It'll be sweat and sorrow from working and tilling the ground for food. Now, I want to deal with this question of who sinned? Was it Adam or was it Eve? Because I've, I've heard different preachers in different camps take different stances on this. Well, it was all Adam. Well, it was all Eve. Listen, I'm going to tell you, the Bible says both. Now, if God says both, there's a reason for that. Wouldn't you agree? Wouldn't you agree? 1 Timothy 2, just listen. Who sinned, man or woman? I say mankind sinned. Mankind sinned. 1 Timothy 2, 14. And Adam was not deceived... But the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Aha! It's that woman, see? It's that woman you gave me. Do we stop there or do we keep looking? Line upon line, precept upon precept. 1 Corinthians 5, 15, 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. What's he talking about? Well, that first Adam, because of his sin, he died. Romans 5, 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, so that all have sinned. Both are guilty. Mankind has sinned, and they're guilty. Somebody says, well, your kids are terrible. That's yeah, my wife's fault. Your kids are terrible. It's my husband's fault. How about it both? Doesn't it take two parents to lead a child? And if there's a problem, usually it's both, because they're not working together. Here's what's interesting. Proverbs 1, 8, listen to this. It says, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Proverbs 1 says there's, instru there's instruction from father and law from the mother. Proverbs 6, verse 20, very similar. My son, keep the commandments, keep thy father's commandment, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Now, wait a minute. God's saying both have a responsibility with children. You can't just say it's one or the other. There's two working together. Dad answers for the leadership in the house, especially when he refuses to lead, right? Isn't that true? Especially when he's not doing his job. Mom is also a lawmaker in the house, but under the authority of the man as God has set her. It's teamwork. And if you want good children, then you have to submit yourself to the will of the Lord and find your perfect place. Now, you're in Genesis 3. Look at verse number 20. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Now God's saying, wait a minute. Now he's a judge and he's on the earth. We need to separate him from the tree of life. Let me give you a little bit of information about the tree of life. We will see it again in the end times. In Ezekiel 47, it talks about the river of life, and it says there will be uh, trees on either side of it. And it says, And the river upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that, shall grow all trees for me, whose leaf shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. The leaf for medicine, the tree of life, will actually come back during the millennial reign of Christ. When we come and sit together in the kingdom of God, when, we, when God begins to rule and reign over this wicked earth, and He begins to purge all the sin, and He takes the devil's seat and takes it away. In Revelation 22, He says, And He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and the Lamb. And in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, there was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. 
And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. God has a plan. The tree of life will come back. Right now, it's not available to us on earth. At this moment, though, he had to stop and separate. He didn't want Adam and Eve uh, being able to have advantage of the tree of life as he did. So continue in verse 23. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now this is interesting. Cherubs or cherubims are a special category, a classification of angels. Here God says we're going to protect the tree. Look at it in verse 24. It says cherubims plural. Anybody know how many angels are here? Anybody want to take a guess? Two. Two? Good guess. How about four? You say, prove it. All right. Close. Yeah, good idea. Right, because notice what he says. A flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Brother Chad indicated perhaps it's the coordinates, the four coordinates, you know, north, south, east, and west. Perhaps so. Uh, let's take a look here because there's something. So the Garden of Eden has the tree of life and the river of life. Go back one chapter to Genesis 2. We're done with the sermon. I just want to give you this really neat nugget of information about the tree of life in the end times, if time permits. I think we're doing all right. How are we doing on time? All right. Somebody's awake. <laughs> At least one of you are awake. All right. Very good. All right. We need to bring the coffee pot in here or something. All right. Back to Genesis chapter 2. There's some verses that we didn't go too in-depth with. Look at verse number 9. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge and of good and evil. A river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, it is that which passeth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. There is Delium and the onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it which compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. The name of the third river is Hittichel. That is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. Now that is more than likely the only river you guys have heard of before. I don't know. Euphrates is very famous. Now go to Revelation chapter 9. I want you to see this. Go to Revelation chapter number 9. So God kicks Adam out. Now mind you, there would be a global flood later. And so at this point though, I believe that uh, Adam's sons and daughters could have walked up and I witnessed this flaming sword and these cherubims, these angels, because God set them there to protect the way and prevent people from coming in. And uh, now, remind, when the Lord returns and He heals the earth, He'll probably reset things similar to the Garden of Eden. You're in Revelation chapter 9. This is during the time of the wrath of God as He pours out His curses on the earth after He takes away the seat of the power of the Antichrist. Look at Revelation chapter 9, verse number 13. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar which is before God, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. These are the four cherubims. They're protecting the tree of life. Now, mind you, there's been a flood in between this, and this is thousands of years, six, seven thousand years later. But as God pours out, He says, I've got four angels that are down here. They have a flaming sword. He has them for a reason. Look at verse 15. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, and a day, and a month, and a year, to slay the third part of men. The number of the army of the horsemen were two hundred thousand thousand and I heard the number of them and thus I saw the horses in the vision and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire and of jackson and brimstone uh, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone by these three was the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke 
and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouths and in their tails, and their tails were like unto serpents, and had heads with them, with, and they do hurt. Now, obviously we're in a symbolic uh, eschatological, this is end times, I know this is kind of some deep stuff, and I don't want to bog you down with too much of this. We will dedicate an entire month in the near future to end times theology and what the Bible says. But I wanted to show you what I think is a really kind of a neat nugget of information. God set these cherubims to protect the way of life. They're in the Euphrates. And then here we see them. So we see them in Genesis and we see them in Revelation. It's almost like God put them there at the beginning and even during the flood. It's like, I mean, this is supernatural. He says, stand guard and protect. And they did and they do and they continue all the way until the Lord has them specifically for a day and an hour for a purpose. Now again, this is uh, as God is pouring out His wrath on the Antichrist kingdom. God is beginning to purge the earth of the armies that would go against God. And so this is somewhat of a mysterious passage, but I do find it interesting. We see the angels, plural, they're in Euphrates where the tree of life was. They were the Garden of Eden. I almost wonder if we could supernaturally dig down below. Is like the Garden of Eden encapsulated somewhere in the earth? I don't know. I'm not, gonna, I'm not making that a doctrine or banking on it, but it does seem interesting how the Lord has the ability to do things that are mysterious to us. Right? Uh, God does many things that it's like a hidden treasure. I mean, His Word is much the same way. It's like gold buried in the ground. And if you're willing to dig and to find it, there's something precious for us there. Now look, Genesis chapter 3. Mankind fell. Mankind sinned. Because the man and the woman refused to work together for God. One was distracted. The other fell. They had an opportunity to serve the Lord. And they fell. Sin entered the world. And now we live in sinful flesh. I thank God that salvation is a free gift, that salvation is everlasting life. It's not something we can ever lose. But we have to remember, if Adam and Eve, who were made perfect and walked in the presence of God, if they could fall, then so could you. This morning we talked about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and how the only way to fight against that in your marriage is to pray together, to pray publicly, to pray often, and to ask God for protection. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would help us to remember that it's our choice and our duty to serve you with our lives. Lord, I thank you for saving us. Lord, I thank you for giving us your word so we know your will for our life. Lord, I pray that you would give us a good time of fellowship tonight and keep us safe as we go home. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.